Hello listeners of the Eastern Border. This is Søren from the History of Denmark. I myself am a big fan of Chris Japs' podcast and have been following him since his first episode. In the future, I plan on appearing on one of his other shows, People's Democratic Republic of Podcasts, and talk about Danish politics since the end of World War II. Now, I would have liked to make some clever comment about the shared history of Latvia and Denmark, but unfortunately, our two countries haven't had much to do with each other. In any case, if you're interested in learning more about the oldest continuous monarchy in Europe, search for The History of Denmark in your podcast app, or go to www.thehistoryofdenmark.wordpress.com and find the RSS feed there. Now, enjoy the eastern border. Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the very special episode of the Eastern Border. This one, as you might have noticed from the tile, is all about wedding on the Eastern Europe, basically Baltics and the Soviet Union. We'll be going through history of wedding traditions all throughout history, and not just touching uh, Soviet Union, we'll be going all, all the way through. And with me is, well, my fiance Alice. Say hi, Alice. Hi, Alice. <laughs> As I mentioned in the last episode, uh, this this is a, a fundraising one. Yeah, and we thought maybe, you know, to maybe just put it on sale for one dollar or one local currency of whatever. But then I remembered one important thing, which I have posted on Facebook, that our episodes are and shall ever forever remain for free. So if you're listening to this, please, uh, we're doing this for our wedding, which is on the 15th of September. We would be very, very, very happy if you would just go to our website, theeasternboard.lv, and would click the donate button and send us one dollar or one euro or one pound of your local currency. Because uh, if we're going to be ripping off Dan Carlin, we might just go all the way. Well, now, uh, <clears throat> Ben, uh, say, say, say the magical words. A buck a show is all we ask. Or something like that, yeah. Because... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because uh, we're, we're getting married, I am slowly going insane, because of all the paperwork and everything. And yeah, in this episode, we would like to present you what it's actually like to get married in these parts, what it was like to get married in these parts, and um, we're trying our best here not to get completely mad and crazy about all of this stuff. I don't even know what to say, what to say further on with this, uh, so yeah, I'll just let Alice start by doing the ancient traditions of Latvians, because she's kind of an expert on this one. And Alice, could you please tell us why are you an expert and what's your connection with... Uh... Well, generally, I'm just a very interested person in the folklore and traditions of, of Latvia, and I'm very interested in the life of people that lived in this area in the 13th century, 15th century, I'm not a reconstructor, but I am interested in all the theory and the songs, the customs of the time. So what I would like to start with, something that is not specifically in Eastern Europe, but in Europe in general. See, settling down and having a family was already regulated in Europe since the first few centuries of our era. The Council of Nicaea forbid marriage between family members, including close relatives, such as uncles and aunts, in the year 325. By the way, a, a side note, Council of Nicaea is also one designated uh, to combat Arianism, the first major heresy of the Catholic Church. Hmm. And as for finding a wife, there were also laws and regulations being put in place throughout time concerning the oldest manner of acquiring a wife, stealing her, which was a popular way to pick up a girl in the medieval times. Literally. Those who refused such laws were punished by the Christian church starting from the 10th century, with punishments even including death. And uh, knowing the medieval era, if, if, if death meant just chopping your head off, that you got off easy. Yeah. Whereas the first known laws against selling or buying a wife come as far as 1216, when the Pope forbid this to all Christians in Old Prussian regions. Old Prussian region is where modern Kaliningrad is, and Old Prussians are the third, now dead, and a non-existent tribe of the Baltics, of which the living ones are Latvians and Lithuanians. Old Prussians were all wiped out by the Teutonic Order. Now listen to our Northern Crusade episode to find out more. <laughs> <laughs> Shameless plug. 
Starting from the 16th century in the Baltics, you could only get married in a church, which caused an uproar and a lot of negotiations from the locals. Because uh, because we are still pagan by the time. Yeah, by the time we are still pagan. And in fact, in the 1521 Psalm Island Landtag admitted that the only way to force people to get married in churches was by flogging. So a punishment space was accorded in every churchyard, just in case. Go to church on Sunday. Stay for the flogging and then the marriage, I suppose. I don't know. We're, we're going to go to the church and then we're going to get flogged and then we can get married there. Just Kinky. excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing, there had to be a marriage acceptance. You had to get allowed during the time of serfdom. That included a lot of silly regulations, for example... The wedding could only happen for up to three days. You had three barrels or six barrels of wine and beer, and all the leftover foods or some or some part of the food was always to be given and split between the church and the serf. What is interesting is that the kind of infamous tradition of the rites of the first night, primavera things, those weren't that popular in these parts. That is, is kind of a myth there, even though it contained this national tradition of kind of uh, the Stura des Rosa or something, but it well, didn't really happen that often. It, it was some very evil people kind of did it, but... What is it, basically? It's the, basically the idea that you get married, but you don't spend the first night with your husband as a as a wife. You have to have sex with uh, kind of your your big baron, the German noble or something. Oh, that that was... Dear. that Yeah, but that happened very rarely in these parts. Extremely rarely. And it was kind of frowned upon, but frowned upon for very racist reasons, because uh, the local German nobles looked at us serfs here as basically subhuman, filthy animals, scumbags, who don't even know how to read or write or whatever. And, and heard, refused like, to get married in a church. Yeah, and it was kind of looked down on, and it's like, oh, why would I want to do anything with, with those people? <laughs> and it's kind of terrible, it's kind of terrible if you think about it, but hey. It's kind of better than that other, better than that other thing, so to speak. If we go into the traditions of Latvian marriages, or at least the Latvian tribes, if a man, let's say good old Peter, if he was a young man and he felt like it was time to get married, he started looking. Men started this in spring or summer to get married in the fall when all the field work is done. They announced it by blowing a horn in the nights of spring and hot summer nights as they're taking the horses to their nighttime pastures in the fields. In a way, it's warning the locals and local girls to be at their best. Oh, the, the nighttime pasture thing is kind of a local tradition here because during the day you were working in your field, your farm, and you were just doing your jobs. But the, the... And often during the day you had to work with the horses, so in the nighttime you'd take them out into the pastures and... Men usually did this, and they sat there all up all night, and they were always warned not to fall asleep, so that either... Unmarried men, by the way. And they were always told not to fall asleep, because the horses could be stolen by either real people or witches and werewolves. Oh, werewolf traditions are, uh, are very popular in this area. Oh, that, that's for another podcast. Then. And, uh, of course, these young men, let's say, good old Petris, or Peter... Of course, they prepped themselves before they went out looking. So to go out looking, you'd have to prep your horse. And in general, you want to look good. Then they would ride out with their eldest brother or godfather. And they would go to the nearest single house homestead. Because that's how traditionally people lived here. Yeah, we didn't have any villages. We were living in separate homesteads. Latvians are lonely folk. A separate homestead that includes a house, a place where you keep all your food, a place where you do your work, a Barn, place... stable, everything, essentially. Yeah, exactly, and that is one homestead. And when they would go to a homestead, they would pretend to be simple travelers, which was a bad lie, as they were always very well-dressed and prepared. What do you look for a wife or a husband? If she was drop-dead gorgeous... She had to be, first, from the same social standing, of course. There have been exceptions. And secondly, she had to have virtue and honor if she was a good hard worker and a good companion, and she could never be lazy or mean. Similarly, women looked for a noble and virtuous man that wasn't a drunkard and wasn't a widower. So our boy Petris is here, and he sees, let's say, Lienet, and she's way fine. So how does he read if she likes him? As he rides in this horse, the residents of the homestead 
Take him as a guest and take his horse. If they feed the horse pine needles, they're not interested. If they feed the horse oats, then there's some potential. Though, even if your girl gives your horse all them oats, she still isn't the one with a say in this matter. It is the mother and the girl's oldest brother. And they all had all these brothers back then because the families tended to be quite large. And sometimes even the men took along an older lady who would be a sort of negotiator. It's not really a matchmaker, but kind of. Because obviously you just don't marry just because you like someone, no. Once you find out that you kind of like each other, then your families come together and then the whole deal-making begins. Well, it's gonna be the dowry, the guy who wants to get, get his wife usually has to pay some money up front, but the girl has to has to have a dowry, which she has been making in her put a lot. We'll, make a chest we'll get to the dowry later. Sometimes they men didn't choose their ladies so eloquently. Sometimes they literally did just steal them. And if they would really steal them, then of course they again wouldn't go alone. They would steal her at night because oftentimes the girls slept in a separate house from the main house. They slept in the clet, which was where most of the food was kept and it was generally seen as a very fertile and good place. They would often sleep there, so they would be stolen from there. They would be blindfolded so that they don't see where they're taken, especially if they're taken far away. And they would only be unblindfolded when they were they had arrived, so they wouldn't know their way back. It's pretty pretty drastic and tragic, but that's how it was. Being a hardcore criminal is a proud Latvian tradition. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, not really. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't the best way to do it. Yeah, yeah but you know, sometimes it actually happened because the girl kind of wanted it because the, all the negotiations and for example if the girl's older brother or mother didn't like you and you were in love then that was the only way how to grab the girl literally and you know get away with it so to speak <laughs> funny so let's say that peter gets his girl lena it is accepted that they're gonna get married now what there has to be a dowry now a dowry usually had all what the girl had made in her life it had to be sewn linen shirts and knitted mittens and these big scarf slash blanket like things called bilaine that was usually given as a gift to the husband's mother. All sorts of things that when she got married, the girl, she wouldn't have time to make them because she would usually have to take care of the house. To, she would have children, so she wouldn't have any time for her handwork. So a girl with a big dowry that she had filled, and sometimes her mother helped her, that was a good sign that she was well prepared. And this was usually a big wooden box. Sometimes it had some welding on it, sometimes some art on it. I think we will add a picture of it on our website. Can we get a picture of your big box? Yeah, my... <laughs> Alice is special in this case because she keeps to this tradition and I have seen the humongous wooden chest that she has there. Yeah, the wooden chest is about a, I would say almost a meter high. That's, so the wooden chest... That's three feet or something. Yeah, so the chest is like three feet high and I would say four feet long and two feet wide. My personal one is also made out of wood. It has some decorations on it, traditional Latvian symbols and signs. And yeah, I have made some things. Of course, I'm not keeping the tradition completely. I don't have to. We can buy everything we want in H&M or whatever. <laughs> but, but yeah, I have made some things. There are also some things that uh, have been given to me as, you know, preparation gifts for the marriage. You know, some towels, some laundry, fresh new things and some plates and stuff like that and a, and a fine china dining set and all sorts of things. So that is the last thing that we haven't brought to our house, which is pretty heavy. And traditionally, it would also be carried only by the men. It would be the groom and his brothers or the bride's brothers. Now, if we go to the marriage itself, the wedding, let's say, 
What I want to mention is that many of these traditions that I will talk about that happen in the wedding are also very prominent even today. They have changed, but even today and even in the Soviet times, some of these traditions were used as well. And when we talk about the Soviet times and when we talk about weddings in the Soviet Union, you will also see that some of them kind of repeat. Yeah, the, so so you'll hear what, what we're kind of prepared to do if everything goes well. Yeah, so... What was needed for a good wedding were active and proactive guests. Nobody in the guest list was as tame and calm as you could be today. You could not just sit down and eat as soon as you arrive. Oh, no. There were many games, many attractions, many things you had to do. The wedding would start at the bride's house. She would get dressed, she would say goodbye to all her family as she was leaving that house, and then she would be taken on a horse or in a carriage to her husband's house and her new house. The husband would take her down from the horse and lead her in the house, and she would often be blindfolded at this time, both when she is being stolen and not, so that she wouldn't see her way back. And the husband's... Making sure she cannot run away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the husband's mother would guide the new bride into the house where she would sit at the table and her chair was usually decorated with flowers and it was a very special chair. What the bride wore was the traditional dress and not a specifically white dress. That is not a tradition from the 12th or 13th or 15th centuries. But on her head, she usually wore a crown. Usually it was not a flower crown, it was made from either fabric or some beads. If it was a natural crown, then, then the traditional crown would be made out of myrtle. This would come in play later on in the events of the wedding. Some sayings about the wedding day. If you see a single stark by the wedding house during the wedding, then that is a sign of bad luck in the marriage. If you see two... That is a sign of a good and happy marriage. On the morning of the wedding, you have to feed the dogs well so that the marriage and the couple is happy and healthy. Now, a tradition that is still kept on living today and was also prominent in the Soviet Union, the gates to the wedding. This means that during the travel to the husband's house or to where the wedding is held, there would be attractions where the road was somehow blocked you would have to give some sort of price to get forward. Maybe some food, money, beer. Today, you, there are sometimes games that you have to play there, but that is one of the traditions that is still kept alive today, and the weddings that I have been to have also had this tradition. So when they have finally arrived at the house, the like I said, the man takes his wife down from the horse, and he carries her. That is a tradition, again, that is kept doing today, where you have to carry your wife inside, and I think that is a prominent tradition in America as well, that you have to carry the wife inside the new house. They say that you have to look where the bride puts her gaze when she enters the house. If she looks down, she'll be quiet, a little mouse. If she looks up, she'll be stuck up. And, and if she looks at the hearth, then she'll probably be lazy. As it originated, it was a wedding tradition, but now it is also a tradition to do when somebody moves into a new house. Salzmeise. When the wedding happened, there was also a tradition to have a loaf of bread and some salt, well, a lot of salt. And the husband and the wife would take a piece of bread, dip it in the salt, and eat it. And so would all of the guests to ensure happiness and health and all the good stuff to the newlywed couple. Today, when people come over to their friend's house and their friends or whatever relatives have moved into a new house, it's also called salzmeise, and sometimes a traditional gift is a loaf of bread, which has been hollowed out and filled with salt, so that there would always be food in the house and happiness and all the good stuff. Now, when it is time for the table and all the eating, then you ate a lot, as much as you can. There's beer, there's food, there's a freshly killed, probably pig that has been cooked. Everybody eats and drinks to the health of the newlyweds. 
Then, while they were eating, there was also abziedashinas, or this sort of singing where you sing about the people in the room. There was usually one woman who was the leader. She would say a sentence, and then there would be some follower singers who would repeat the sentence. People did this as an activity of being witty and funny and talking about each other. And this is something that is not only done in weddings. This is also done in the summer solstice and in many other events. It is a fun thing to do as long as you have the ability to sort of rhyme and put together some lyrics about the people in the room, then that is a very Latvian thing. There's a specific theater that is a very traditional theater play that is always played before the summer solstice, and they, this year, did a new version of it, and they also had this abziedashinas, and they were singing about the actors, about politicians, about the situation in the world. It was very funny. And after the singing, there's, of course, dancing. And there were many specific dances that were involved, and they were connected to fertility in the couple. There was the long dance, the four couples dance, the six couples dance, the ball of yarn dance, the towel dance, many dances. Although the singing was probably more prominent than dancing, whereas in Russian weddings, the singing is less prominent, but you dance all the time. Usually, around midnight, there was the mitchushana. I could say the hatting. That was a event where the girl's crown, like I said, either made out of myrtle or the fabric and pearl crown, was changed into the hat or the bonnet. The traditional Latvian costumes consisted of headdresses that had symbolic meaning for women. The girls who were unmarried wore crowns, and once the girl was married, she either wore a specific hat or a bonnet. And in this event, the mother of the groom exchanged the girl's crown to the headdress or the hat, and it was involved with a lot of joking around. She often put on some silly hats, some silly headdresses before the right one was found. And this was probably the most important symbolic tradition of when the girl becomes the wife. And after all this comes nighttime. And during the nighttime, one of the traditions that has also continued today was guldishan, or putting to bed. All the guests and the closest relatives took the couple to where they slept, which was also in the kletz, the very fertile place where all the food was kept. The newlywed couple was taken to the clates, they were put down to bed and often locked in, and there were some people that were left out as guards to make sure that uh, everything was going smooth, let's say. But the party didn't stop there. The rest of the guests kept dancing and singing and being happy and making merriment while the couple was left to sleep. In the next morning, the couple was woken up with song and dance. Sometimes they or other guests were pranked during the night. That is also a thing that happens today, and Christmas will tell more about that, how it happened in the Soviet Union. They, this wouldn't be done to the couple, but maybe some other guests. If they slept in a bed, then, and if there were heavy sleepers, their bed, for example, would be... Yeah, or maybe if they were just way drunk, then their bed would just be carried outside from the house into the field, so they would wake up to birds chirping and the sun shining in their eyes, and all sorts of pranks like that. It's likely. It would mostly be also raining. It is likely. It is very likely. And so the new couple was woken up, the door was unlocked, and there were two bowls by the house where they should wash up and wash their faces, and the first two batches of water would be thrown out, and only in the third water they would wash their faces. The second day of the wedding was when the family got closer together, because oftentimes uh, the groom's, or let's say the husband's side of the family and the wife's side of the family didn't know each other well. So this was the time when they got together and they kind of introduced each other more and got to know each other and got to know each other's families. Sometimes this was the time when the dowry was given out. And the bride has made all these gifts in her dowry. They give the vilaine, 
or sedene, or the sort of shawl slash blanket wrap to the husband's mother. She also gives mittens to some husband's brothers and sisters and her mother and father. This is also the time when the new wife, who now lives with the husband and often his mother, was shown around the homestead of the places where the work should be done and what would happen where, and the wife, the new wife, would leave offerings to gods. There were three prominent gods, Diapsmar and Lima, which is god as in... Don't think about the traditional god as the Christian god. It's no, no, like, no. It's more like these Odin. Are, yeah, these are more god. Latvian and Baltic pagan gods, and we could get the whole episode about Latvian deities, uh, but basically the three main ones was God, it was usually portrayed as a nice old man, and he was a good man. Mara, which was usually a brunette, and she was the one in charge of the physical part of the world. She was also the patron of the cows and all the cattle. She was the patron of the house of snakes, which were not a bad thing, but in fact a good thing, unless they were, of course, venomous. And women were, witches were called snake snake women for for this reason because they worshipped Mara. Yeah, yeah, and the third deity was Lima, which She's is a bombshell. She's a bombshell. She was usually a blonde. She was nice and happy, and she was the one who was giving people their fate. She was called upon when there was a birth to make sure that the new child is given a good life and good fate, and and she was also called into all the times when good luck and happiness was needed. So, of course, she was asked in this event as well. And so the wife would leave offerings to God and to nature to make sure that the spirits of this new house and this local place that she's now going to be living would be benevolent to her. She would leave little gifts like little tiny belts, tiny crafts that she would leave around. And, of course, there are much, much more tiny details that differ from area to area, but this is the general gist, and the wedding would happen for two to three days, and these many traditions are still done today, and they were also kept up in the Soviet Union. And now, for a little intermission. Hey guys! Thank you for joining us in our fundraising episode. This episode is a fundraiser for our wedding, and we would appreciate if every one of you would send a dollar or a few to our celebration and honeymoon. You can donate to us via PayPal or become a patron on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash the eastern border. We would like to thank everyone that has donated via PayPal up to now and our patrons on Patreon. We value and appreciate you very much, and you help us be the best we can. This is a special episode, but if you like our podcast, check us out on Facebook or Twitter, at The Eastern Border, and leave us your comments and questions there, or on our page, theeasternborder.lv. We love seeing your reviews on Stitcher and iTunes, so if you have something to say, go shout it at the top of your fingertips. This song is Auto Disney, or... The Little Car Song by Nora Bumbier and Viktor Slavchenix from the Latvian movie A Gift to a Lonely Woman from the 70s. The car was an essential element of Soviet weddings. How, you ask? Well, let's go back to the stories. And we're back. Greetings, comrades, once again. So, now we can move on to the Soviet era of weddings. I'll have to start with a very interesting situation which happened starting from 85, when Gorbachev kind of did this semi-prohibition thing. There was a phenomenon in the Soviet Union called the dry wedding. If you were kind of doing your celebration after party of the wedding at home, you could kind of use some alcohol there. But... If you were renting a place, such as a culture house, one of mentioned in the previous episodes, or a cafe, or, or anything like that, if you were renting a place, you really had to cheat. Why? Because 
randomly KGB could appear at your wedding and check if you're using alcohol in this dry law era. But what do I do if I really, really want to drink at that wedding? Oh, everyone really wants to drink at the wedding because uh, alcohol and the Soviet Union are not two separate things. I'd rather say they have this symbiotic relationship and it's like <laughs> it's a single entity. <laughs> or you could only legally have a single bottle of champagne and some maybe some dry wine on, on the table in there. Also, if you were some sort of a, a chief of some sort, like a di factory director or some important person in the party or, you know, s some sort of a higher up or you worked in an important position, you couldn't use alcohol whatsoever in any celebrations. So what the people did was that they basically made cocktails by puring pure spirits in coffee cans, mixing them with syrup and coffee, or in lemonade bottles. And these lemonade bottles, they were all made of, by the way, you know, kind of painted glass there. Or colorful glass. Yeah, Green colorful glass. Green glass, brown glass. So they, we had no plastic bottles in the Soviet Union. Uh, the idea was the fact that you really had to hide any, any form of booze. And uh, our dad told us a story when in his cousin's wedding... He's not our dad yet. Oh, he's my dad, yeah. Basically, uh, in his cousin's wedding... He was the guy responsible for mixing up all these cocktails. And he was given a bunch of, like, a five-liter jar of spirits. And a bunch like of lemonade. pure alcohol. Pure alcohol, yeah. And uh, a bunch of, of, of this lemonade. And he's making these cocktails in these lemonade bottles. And he has to check, you know, the quality of the cocktail. So he, uh, out of every bottle, he drinks 50 grams of it. Uh, after two hours... He decided that he'll just go to sleep and not participate in the wedding whatsoever because he was just too drunk just from making all of these cocktails. And now, the, the other thing which is important is that in the Soviet era, there were no marriages in churches whatsoever. The Soviets did not did approve not. of religion at all, so... The Soviet Union was officially kind of an atheistic state. No, there were people who could get married in churches, but that was dangerous and it was not very popular. Basically, if you just went to church, that didn't count legally. That wasn't a legal marriage. So there was there were these special places, institutions, which were shortened to ZAKS. It's a civil, civil, uh, secular marriage institution place. And it still exists today. Yeah, I, I don't know if you have analogs there in the Western world or in the United States, but it's a government office specifically for signing secular marriages. Those places are all over, all over the place. You could also get married at your local party committee or at your state mm -hmm. house. Well, there were many places, but these were the specialized ones where people got married. It was kind of a, a way of replicating church institutions just very secularly. And our source, which is a Soviet era family encyclopedia, which is an excellent source, basically calls them the Civil Service Ritual Registration Act space, or something. Uh, in Latvian, it's Civil Stavokli Aktu Registratius Ritual Talpa. It's the place of the marriage ritual of the Civil Service State Act. It's very complicated, but that's but you you kind of have to call this analog of, of a church specifically designed for weddings somehow, don't you? Yeah, and We've been there today as well, uh, you know, in, in, in our time. And they are still places that are not just government buildings, but they're buildings that have, you know, an office, but they also have these specific uh, place where it is decorated and pretty and you can get married and have the ceremony there. Yeah, but in Soviet era, you had to get married there and only then you could go with a paper that you're already officially secularly married to the church if you wanted to. And a lot of religious people, of course, did, but just going to the church like didn't work out. And right now in Latvia, it's currently like this that we had to have this uh, this paper stating that we want to get married in this Zax or Zimsraks Nuandalia, this this uh, agency. But then you can take that paper to the church and get legally married there, because this petition that you want to get married is not the marriage itself. You just can get the paper that you want to get married and take it to the church and get married there, which are which we're doing, by the way. But uh, yeah, and in Soviet era, you just had to get there. We'll get to these papers uh, themselves, too, this petition paper, because that's also a remnant of the Soviet era. But uh, as we spoke about the booze, you couldn't use at all any alcohol in this Zox. You know, normally over here, the tradition goes that if 
you don't invite every every guest that goes to the church to your party. You just invite some smaller amount because parties are really expensive. And after you get get married, you just you know pour some wine, give 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 some champagne or wine around everyone for the celebration. But you couldn't do it at this era in the Zaks at all. So instead of just um, instead of just giving a glass of champagne to every guest around there after this wedding ceremony in the Zaks. What people did was officially they passed around glasses of orange, grape, or apple juice. Of course, this orange, grape, or apple juice contained at least 50 to 60 percent of spirits, as has been mixed before. So this created the opposite effect that instead of people just drinking a glass of champagne, they drank some really hard, like uh, 80 proof, which is 40 percent alcohol, uh, strong drinks. Instead of water, this juice was used. So some people were like really getting wasted already before the celebration. Now about the papers, which is important, is that as you know, everything was deficit in the Soviet era. Now to think about all of this, what's the bare minimum that you need for a wedding? Okay, so if we had Peter, Petrus, and Lena in the ancient times, now we need uh, a new couple that's getting married in the Soviet era. What should we name them? Uh, Natasha and... Ivan. Ivan. Ivan and Natasha are getting married. So what do they need for a wedding? Well, the bride needs a dress, the groom needs a suit, and of course they need the rings. Apart from all the small other things, these are the essentials, right? Also nice shoes. Of really course. Good shoes. Of course. Now, those things were completely deficit products. You couldn't get them anywhere. They're only in the black market, that is. And if you could get them, they were very expensive. Yeah, well, if you think those were getting easily done, then you haven't listened to the show. Uh, so so that the newlyweds wouldn't completely go bankrupt, black market prices were insane, in Riga and in other cities, there were these special stores for the newlyweds. For example, the store Spring, or Pavasars. In the Lenin Street, which is now the Freedom Street, uh, Lenin Street 412. Now, the thing is, um, those were kind of like the Tuzeks or the Bonai stores where you only could spend money for foreign currencies. But we spoke about this in a, in a previous episode, I think. You only could go in and purchase things in these stores if you had this paper that you're planning on getting married. You could purchase stuff there with sort of a discount. Now, to understand how much everything really cost at that point, you have to say that two very basic wedding rings like very basic gold bands, cost 180 rubles together. A doctor that was a surgeon earned 150 rubles. So 30 rubles less than two wedding rings was the salary of a surgeon in the Soviet era. Yeah, so apparently not much choice, really. But that was the place where you actually could get something for your money. That was where you could find something that actually you really wanted, and that's that's where you could actually purchase some good shoes and a good suit. And, of course, people abused the system, obviously, because, like I have also mentioned in previous episodes, the system of uh, small-time corruption and knowing the right people everywhere was widespread. So if you knew someone in this Zax, and if you had some right friends there, then you could just write up as many wedding applications as you wanted, and some people did it like up to eight times, except they never get married. They just got different wedding applications with different people and just went, went to buy stuff there. It was kind of interesting, but of course, after, after a few times, you actually have to kind of uh, give some money to the people working in this spring store, because, you know, if you go there for the fifth time, then... Um, you know, they, they might start looking at you weirdly, they might even report you, but, you know, the system was geared up in such a way that, you know, we have a, we have a saying in Latvian, one hand washes the other. And you can only do this for your first wedding. That means that, yeah, you could go five times if you don't get married, but once you get married, you can't go back there for your second wedding or anything like that. So only people who haven't been married could do this. If you got married once, then got divorced, and got married the second time, then no. I, I suppose the Soviet government really thought you were supposed to use the same wedding ring just twice. Now, except those who were completely alternatively thinking people. Like, the average common Soviet man went to this Zaks or family register meeting place, sort of. Because 
I honestly don't know the proper English name for this. Everyone went there with a car. Now, of course, as cars were an extremely luxury thing in the Soviet Union, everyone had to either rent or borrow a car, because that was a standard part of the Soviet wedding. Now, and of course, the car had to be decorated in some, some way. Now, I, I think in the in the America, at least as far as I know from the movies, they put these cans behind the car, I suppose? Yeah, and they spell just married. Yeah, well, in, in here, these things never happened in the Baltic republics, that is, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. In the front part of the car, uh, you put two symbolic humongous rings. Decorative. Decorative, decorative rings, which symbolize the wedding. But the main Russian people, in their ways they put a huge doll in front of a car, which basically symbolized that, you know, it won't be too far until the first kid. So after after these this ceremony in, in the Zox, kind of religious people went to church after that. Traditionally after the ceremony, and if you were if you were religious and went to the, to the church after the Zox, then you went to the party location where you kind of ate a uh, wedding isn't real unless you have a huge party without eating and drinking. With eating and drinking. Yeah. Now, in, in this Soviet era, especially in the 80s, when the stagnation had really hit in, as I've mentioned, that's where the scarcity of products really happened in the Everyday Life episode, you really had to put a lot of effort in so that your kind of meal could be in a way that kind of would be respectable, so that you could have some, some good foods on the table. Official offers, like official menu in restaurants that could kind of be adequate, was extremely tiny. So everyone, like almost everyone who was do- who were making these wedding parties, they, they tried to make their own stuff. Like uh, they rented a restaurant, but they made their own food. So all of the nice little corruption or blots were used. Like if you knew someone who works in a store, who works in a kind of food factory or or who works in a large kolkhoz everywhere everything you know you used every possible way how to corrupt things out and get all these deficit nice products and especially deficit were all sorts of cakes and pastries and that was a great rarity so women who were good cooks were very appreciated at this time because they would make the meal for the wedding or sometimes the funeral for example, such exclusive things like whipped cream, you know, you could get it from your blots friends, your corrupted friends, in three liter jars, secretly. And these great women who would cook the meal, they would also make a traditional countryside cake. Which is a question, by the way, on Facebook as... Uh... Previously, we asked people to ask, give us some questions on Facebook, and we're trying to answer them as best as we can. Here, the mm, cakes with many, like, you know, floors, like three levels or something, Layers. They, many levels were not popular. Instead, they would grow in width and size, up to almost the size of a, a car, car wheel. Yeah. And the thing is that um, the cakes you could buy in the stores at the time, they were only very, very lean. A fun fact is that the wedding cakes that had many levels actually came from Queen Victoria and her wedding. And she was the first one who had this traditional, great, many-leveled wedding cake with all sorts of sugary confectionery decorations, birds, fruit, everything made out of sugar. And for her children, she made even bigger cakes, ones that were up to 11 feet in size, and they had even confectionery sugar columns. It was a structure made out of sugar. If you listen to Lesser Bonaparte, you know I love Queen Wiki. Yeah. So, but back to our traditional countryside cakes. For the biscuit, for, for, for the sponge of the cake itself, you would use 60 to 70 eggs. It's, it's because, uh, like I said, the store-bought cakes were very lean. Now, when talking about this unofficial part of the wedding, now there are some a few traditions which I, th- I think that those are kind of still going strong here. They are still some... going strong, and some of them are, like I said, from the traditional Latvian marriages. But these are traditions that are not popular in America. I, I think so, at least. Uh, we really can't tell much, but this is what's going on here. 
the newlyweds don't actually organize the party. It's the so-called vede or the leads, which is a married couple that you know that's a friend it's, of the family. It's similar to what you have as the bridesmaids and the men of honor. The, these are the leads here in Latvia. And it's usually a married couple that organizes the whole party and makes sure that the bride and groom are happy and everything like that. So one of the interesting things and traditions of, of uh, Soviet weddings was that after you got married, the newlyweds, uh, before like the party and everything, every, everyone else went to the party, but the newlyweds have this tradition that between the wedding and the party, they go to a place which is special to them, and they put flowers there. And the popular place is uh, Turaida, was it? or the, the Rose of Turaida, which is um, kind of an ancient Latvian story about a girl in the crusading era, uh, in the Baltic crusade, a Latvian girl who fell in love with uh, a guy, but uh, a German crusader wanted to marry her, so they committed suicide together with, with her like loved one. I think so, at least I'm not an expert on that one. But, and she has this special kind of tomb grave thing as she made the sacrifice for her love. It's kind of her, like Romeo and Juliet, except Latvian. And that was one of the popular spots, but especially in the 80s, one of the more popular spots to go if you were really patriotic and you had to be very careful on this was actually to go and place flowers in the Freedom Monument. And that was, even though it was frowned upon, even the local militia and KGB guys uh, at that time, in the 80s, didn't arrest people who did this. Because, you know, getting arrested in your wedding day? Yeah, no. That's a fun wedding. Yeah, but, uh, well, of course, right after, in the major newspapers, there would be these articles soon after that, oh no, another couple, another couple of young people have fallen to the imperialistic propaganda that they're giving, putting flowers down to a monument that symbolizes uh, oppression and something they don't even understand, that they should become wiser and become more communistic and follow the communistic morale, of course. But yeah, while going to that place where you put the flowers, because they go there, they put the flowers there, and then they move to the party. So while between all of this, uh, they, there were these... Uh, Gates of Honor, which Alice mentioned previously. Yeah, the, the wedding gates. <laughs> so obviously the car that you used to travel to the place was stocked full with booze, mostly vodka. As the gifts to those who put the gates in front of you. And sometimes it was just a rope. In, in Soviet era, it was maybe just a rope with balloons and all sorts of glitter and stuff like that. But sometimes they would drive a heavy car or even a tractor in front of the world so that they would get the gifts to let the newlyweds through. Sometimes it was really, really annoying because everyone and everyone could do that. Like completely everyone who was like your guest. Uh, there was no limitations on how many times this could happen. So this could get like really super annoying. But obviously you happiness is mandatory. <laughs> and you, you can't really show that this, this bothers you. The gypsies. It is a tradition that... I hope we're not racist here. I really no, hope we're not No, racist, no, no. That's, that's how it was called at the time. This did happen sometimes in the uh, older Latvian uh, weddings as well, which is people who weren't invited, especially in the countryside, would come to the wedding around midnight or after midnight, and they would come in masks, and they would dress up silly... And they would come, they would drink, they would dance, they would um, make fun of all the guests, make fun of the bride and groom. But according to tradition, they still had to be treated well as guests. And they are uh, seen as a good omen. If you have these gypsies in your wedding, then the marriage should be happy. Yeah, because it's kind of considered that if no one who is not invited doesn't arrive at the wedding, then, you know, no one likes you. So you're a bad person, so ob obviously. And another thing about the wedding guests especially is that I, I suppose the American wedding guests don't even understand how lucky they are. Because, you know, all they all they do is, I, I suppose, uh, we, we only go, have this knowledge from the movies, really. Yeah, we know it only from the movies. So you go to your rehearsal dinner and then you have the real wedding and everybody just sits down, has a good time, says some toasts, does some dancing. But, oh no, not here. Like I said, in the traditional Latvian weddings, the guests had to be very proactive and participating in everything. And it is the same way here. 
because it was also the same in Russia and in, in all, all these all these places really yeah and in Soviet era and even now the guests cannot be that comfortable in fact the organizers of the wedding often make all sorts of games and attractions sometimes even it's like stripping games and games that encourage you to drink a lot a lot of crazy games. oh that, that's also called low Guys, uh, I know Americans play this beer pong, which is completely not popular here. Mm-hmm. Over here, beer pong is non-existent. Uh, sometimes people play a game called Lither Ball. Oh, Lither Ball is a crazy game. <laughs> now, the traditional wedding version states that you have to run 10, 10 meters like back and forth, but you have to drink a shot of vodka after each meter. Yeah. Like 10 shots running forward, 10 shots running back. Who can does this the fastest wins? Yeah, no, that's a crazy game, and I don't recommend it. I recommend it not with shots, but like some easier alcohol, if you want to try it. Also, a uh, regular tradition, at least that I have seen, is you get a pint of beer, and then there's this speed drinking contest of the pint of beer. Of course, that's a, tr- that's a classic thing. Now, in the Russian wedding, and not only Russian, in our eastern region, Latgale, where I, I, I uh, stayed in Ludza, which is also in that region, near the Russian border, traditionally... There is a saying and there's a tradition that the wedding isn't successful if nobody fights. Now, it's not to the great anyone, and that's actually an important tradition, and you had to fight somehow, even though it was just faking it or very demonstratively, but if there's not a fight there, it's not a real wedding. So there were cases where my dad was in the wedding band, and he's just playing for this Russian wedding, and he just sees that two best friends are just uh, talking there and right next to him and saying, come on, this, everything is going so smoothly, but no one's fighting. This is going to be terrible. The newlyweds are not going to have a happy life. Hey, how about we start fi- How about we start a fight with each other? <laughs> and then they beat the living crap out of everyone. I mean, between themselves. And then people, of course, join in because, hey, fighting is essential. Yeah, and that's, But by the way, that's not the only tradition in uh, Russia that involves fighting. They have this very special day. One of the interesting uh, Orthodox traditions is that in the winter, right before the spring, uh, they jump into a f- uh, men jump into a frozen lake. Mm-hmm. Then they come out of the lake and then they beat each other up brutally. <laughs> it happens, yeah. <laughs> it's it's a real it's it's not to degrade anyone. It's not a bad thing. It's just that what they do, because really uh, we we are not anti-Russian here, but the guys who were the newlyweds. Oh, they were tortured as well a bit. I mean, for one, uh, you know, they arrive in their car from their trip to put flowers in a place that's really important to them. Sometimes also they they put these uh, padlocks on the bridge somewhere. Yeah, that's a classic thing all over the world, I think. I I think so, but but I I, I don't know. We're kind of not going to do this. Uh, Yeah, first off, if those guys arrive later than everyone else to the party because of all these gates of honor and, and all of these things, and the first things first, uh, the tradition states that the, the groom has to hold the bride, or at that point, husband has to hold his wife in his hands and carry her. And while he's carrying her, he has to be blindfolded and step on a plate, which is covered with, uh, with a towel. Mm-hmm. And essentially, you have to break the plate on the towel in as many parts as possible. Yeah, I mean... I- it is kind of a hybrid of what they did used to do in Latvian weddings. And breaking dishes and glasses uh, is actually... It, there is a saying in Latvia that dishes and glasses break for good luck. So this is like a hybrid of those things. Yeah, and um, after that, after this dish breaking, he gets his blindfold removed. but he And he still kind of has to carry his uh, newlywed wife over the doorstep of the place where... There, where the meal is being held. Now, this has led to some tragic consequences as... Uh, oh, my God, yeah. Because uh, because of some student weddings. Again, this comes from my dad, because he used to, as a musician who were, who played bass, and, and for the 20 years in opera, he had seen many things. And in one occasion, one of his personal friends, who was, well, let's just say not a very strong person, he got his intestines ripped because of this, because uh, his wife was of the... Would you say not very skinny kind? Yeah, she's on the heavier side. Yeah, and, which is fine, but you know, which he is couldn't, which is which is fine, but because he of couldn't this, carry her for that long, apparently he, he tried really tragic. hard, and and his intestines ripped. Yeah, so be careful, guys. Just, just don't overdo it. 
Now, even if you even if if you manage to carry your your wife uh, carefully and nicely into the place where there's there's a meal, oh no no, no. don't expect to get to your party right on. No no no. Traditionally, the, the, in the Soviet wedding, for example, there were many tasks that uh, the newlyweds had to do. Mm-hmm. There is this one game where there's an uh, apple and uh, somebody is holding the apple, and uh, each of the newlyweds has to take a bite and say a nickname, a cutesy nickname that they're gonna name the other person. And it takes a long while to eat the whole apple, and they have to do it like the groom says something and bites the apple, and the bride says something. And another one is. But that's a humane one. That's a humane one. That's chill. Uh, another one is that the groom has to chop up wood like a really really big block of wood and the bride has to either you know change the diapers on a doll which is chill but they can also make her you know wash a huge load of dishes so say goodbye to that manicure ladies yeah and while while your newlywed wife is washing a mountain of dishes literally they sometimes actually specifically collected dishes for days yeah and piled them up so that the, the, the wife could do this and yeah and the, the, the piece of wood that you had to chop into tiny 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 bits with a with an axe yeah that was also kind of hardcore really and only after all of these tasks you could get to the actual party now we have to pay attention to a very special region of the soviet union the Caucasus Republics, which are by this point already famous because of many other episodes. Uh, The people from the Caucasus are usually kind of considered to be the tough guys of the Soviet Union. You know, they're living in the mountains and and with their strong Muslim traditions, because they're mostly Muslim. Now, these guys are tough, and uh, one of the examples of how it is like is that, you know, I have a master's in Western philosophy, and uh, I had this professor who taught academical logics to me. And he was from Georgia. And uh, his name was Vsevolod Kachan. He just came to Latvia in Soviet era, it was po- as, was, as it was popular, because we were the mo- westernmost part of the Soviet Union. So he just kind of stayed, stayed here, and he was uh, kind of a 60-year-old, bit chubby, short man who taught me academical logics in university. Now, and uh, in one of the lectures, one of the lectures, one of the students was just using his smartphone and pull- pulling it out. And that really annoyed Mr. Kachans. So um, Mr. Kachans steps on the table, pulls out his knife, this huge dagger that he carries with him at all times, and says, Student, I might be a philosophy professor, but I am from the Caucasus, and you will respect me, and if you won't, I'm going to ram this knife straight through your phone. So, uh, yeah, just understand this. So these guys, as I mentioned before... uh, only secular marriages were legal, but people in the Caucasus often, and also in Uzbekistan and in Siberia, where the tribal traditions were strong and uh, those religious feelings were also kind of tough, they just ignored that. Because in the European part of the Soviet Union, the police control, the KGB control, the milici, I'm sorry, it's not police, uh, the control of the state was kind of strong. And so was in the Far East, where like Khabarovsk, or Vladivostok, where the main industrial centers were organized, but if you live in the Caucasus with strong regional traditions, or you live in Siberia, where there's just, you know, Gulag, 100 miles village, Gulag, something like that, yeah. Uh, the overall power of the state isn't, not, isn't so strong, so a lot of people there, and by the way, this is a question asked by our one of the most devout listeners, Kelly Tudor. Hi, Kelly. Say hi to Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Yeah, uh, she asked us how the people of those places uh, deal, dealt with this, and the answer is that, well, they didn't. They either did it the way everyone else did, but more often than not, they just called their local mula, or their shaman, if it was Siberia, and they just got married their own way. They just basically ignored whatever the state demanded of them. And I, I, I think I mentioned that in episode 2, Soviet Army, that uh, some places in the Soviet Union were, like, so remote, that people didn't even know that what country were they living in. They really didn't care about the state. And I'll make a specific episode about this, but in the 70s, I guess it was 72, an old believers, which is a subsect of Orthodox Church, an old believers couple was found living in Siberia. They had lived there for 40 years, and they didn't even know that the Soviet Union even existed. They just went there during the revolution, like their ancestors went there or something, and they just had lived in Siberia for 40 years without any contact with the civilization. And sometimes uh, people were literally conscripted for the Soviet army using the nets there. So uh, it's just the vastness of of all the place. 
But yeah, about these tough Caucasus and, and the Siberian guys, uh, yeah, even though they sometimes just blatantly ignored this, but when they didn't, oh boy. See, um, in the Caucasus there's this tradition, like, and when I'm talking about Caucasus, I mean Azerbaijani, Georgians, Chechens, Ossetans, all these things. Now, traditions of Caucasus demand that each man carry a gun, a weapon of some sorts. In modern days, yeah, that's a gun, that's most likely either a shotgun or an AK-47, and this tradition went on all through the Soviet era, even with massive gun control. But those people just seem to get their guns in the black market, and even in the modern day, this still is the modern day. Basically, in the wedding, uh, in the traditions of those regions, it was a tradition. It was very traditional to just pick up your own gun and show respect to the newlyweds by shooting it in the air. If you were a real man. If you're a real man, and being a real man is really, really important there. So everyone just shut up, uh, just shut up their guns in the air. Now you know what? It's 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 kind of not that dangerous or crazy if it just happens during the unofficial part or in the mountains or or in the Caucasus or something. But lately, oh no, lately the tradition is that uh, you shoot up your guns in the air while driving in a car from this Zach's place or your church place to the party location while driving in a car. And that doesn't happen just in the countryside. There are famous stories in these parts that uh, this has happened in Moscow, driving through the main street, the Tvera Boulevard. During the Chechen wedding, people were just driving in, a, in a, this escort line through this Tvera Boulevard to their party place while blasting up AK-47s in the air through the windows. Now, obviously, uh, police or militia, I, th I think it's police now in Russia as well, but yeah, obviously the organs of power kind of didn't look very nicely at such fireworks, so to speak. But the, the guilty ones got some, some minor monetary fines, because um, how do you really argue with, with the 10 cars full with people who are just blasting their AK-47s through the air? Now, and, and these uh, Caucasus weddings, those were kind of not the only not traditional ones. For example, another, another wedding that my dad has visited personally was uh, one of the hippie weddings. It, it happened in the 70s. Basically, and these weddings were almost refused to be registered there. Because everyone arrived uh, in a bit of a not traditional way of getting married. For one, everyone in this wedding had arrived in barefoot but wearing jeans, like jean outfits, jean jackets and, and Levi's in Europe. And the only difference of all of this is that the bride and the groom had white jeans. Now, obviously, obviously, this cost a huge fortune, as jeans cost insane amounts of money, like I said, about 200 rubles. But yeah, these were hippie weddings, and these were, these were, they were almost not even registered. Now, these uh, extreme cases, like, like this one, those are really rare, because, uh, well... Wedding as one of the more serious cases in the person's life, I suppose. Uh, they keep up the traditions over here in these parts the longest. Now, those were interesting traditional weddings, but there were these special kinds of weddings in the Soviet Union. They were called the Komyalnezhukazos, or Komsomo wedding. Basically, this was a tradition that the Soviets tried to enforce on people. The idea was that uh, you were in this Komsomol, the communist youth organization, and if you were getting married, according to this communist tradition, you would basically, instead of just get, grabbing your friends and your family, remember the Soviet Union is a collectivist country, you get married with your party. With your party and everyone you work with. Hmm. Your bride works in one factory, you work in a different factory, all of the people from those factories come together because it's a collective thing. Collective must be involved even in the wedding. Party leaders are supposed to give speeches in the wedding, stating how this wedding was good for the communism. And this was kind of a popular way of, of doing it. Although these weddings were huge, uh, they happened now and then because uh, of the allure that the you know communist party could actually help you finance that a bit. But there was a weird form of this where you just involve all your co-workers, um, like, the collective was really involved in, in all of this. They really didn't kind of uh, get very popular that much. And it was a weird thing that Soviets tried to try to press on, on to people. So yeah, even, even though the Soviets did this uh, 
did this weird thing around there with the Soviet weddings. Yeah, um, they also had their own very special traditions, and I don't, I don't think Alice has mentioned this one. But one of the weird things is that um, after all of this, after the newlyweds have went to sleep, the party just continues on. The idea is that sometimes these jokes in the Soviet era, like we, we spoke about the jokes and the things that you had to endure in traditional weddings, but in the Soviet era, sometimes the things, the pranks that were pulled on the party guests by other less drunk party guests were quite rude. <laughs> Again, then this comes from my dad. Uh, there was this occasion where uh, the newlyweds car, because they also could get pranked, the, uh, all the wheels were removed from the newlyweds car and just stuffed up in a column on a chimney on a kind of countryside two-floor building. And you know, that's kind of hard to get uh, four car wheels f down from a chimney of a building. Another thing was that uh, if, if you were a guest in the party and you went to sleep earlier than others, then obviously everyone removed their shoes. Yeah, this is a thing that I kind of understand, at least at least as, as we see in the movies, you Americans rarely wear slippers at home. Yeah. Everyone, like, it's very... We're kind of like Japan in, in this case, we have a lot of common with those people, we, we always We always take shoes. our shoes off as we enter the house, and we have different shoes or slippers that we wear inside or walk barefoot. And when we see, when we see kind of in the, in the series, sort of, that we see on television that someone is just sitting on a couch or in a bed with like their oogies on and it causes... It's called Oggs. Oggs. <laughs> oogies. Whatever. I don't know how they're called, <laughs> but that causes massive cringe, really. I, I, ho yeah. I hope most people don't do that and ju that's just in, in, the, yeah, in the movies, really. Because that's kind of removing your boots while playing in the bed or just laying down with your boots. Ugh. They're just terrible. It is terrible. Anyway, yeah, uh, as everyone removes their shoes, uh, one of the more popular pranks was that your stuff, your shoes, gets get, get put, like, mixed together with everyone else's shoes in a huge bag. And then in the morning you have to kind of buy them back. With booze, of course, and you have to do tasks. Now, usually, by the way, an interesting fact is that you kind of have to buy these shoes back with booze or with actual money. The money and the booze and whatever, that goes to the newlyweds. It's a sort of tradition, basically, instead of walking around with a hat, like we're kind of doing now and asking people to donate us for a wedding. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, that's a tradition which makes everyone kind of pinch in something for the newlyweds so that you could get your shoes back or your hat back or something. But it was mostly shoes and you have to pay just the symbolic amount of stuff. And that's kind of the rules of the game. Yeah, if you, if you really felt offended by these traditions and if you feel offended because that's what's happening here, yeah, if, if you kind of feel offended about this, uh, that's impolite to show anything like this. Those are the rules of the game. If, if someone takes your stuff and you have to buy it back for small amounts of money, no, 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 that's fine. If you feel offended by this, that's considered extremely rude and impolite. Now, interestingly enough, there is just one thing that never happened in the Soviet weddings, as far as I know, of the common people. Of course, if you were a gigantic party person getting married in this Komsomol, that's a bit different thing, but... Uh, as far as I know, and as far as I've spoken with people, and I've, I've read in the memories of other people, no one in the Soviet Russia, from the common people, no one drank for the party or for Marx or for the Soviet Union. Wedding is a, a celebration about love and respect, I suppose. It's an individual celebration. So, uh, I don't know. I, I think I, I saw a movie once where, where people were drinking for the Soviet Union in the party. In the yeah, wedding party, but, but that's a movie, yeah. And um, Now, one interesting thing is that obviously everyone gave gifts to the newlyweds. That's, that's, that's also tradition. That, that, that's tradition everywhere. Money as a gift is uh, kind of popular here only in the last 10 years. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Uh, I think that gift cards are popular in America and it's kind of impolite to give money as a wedding gift. But over here, if you put it in a, in a fancy envelope, it's considered kind of perfectly normal to give someone just money. Mm -hmm. In the Soviet era, you couldn't do that as you can do that right now here. In the Soviet era also, the money wasn't really that, that important because you know what? You really didn't have much use for it because you can't buy stuff in the Soviet Union. So it might be interesting, uh, most popular gifts were like sets of dishes, kitchenware, blankets, bedspreads, duvets. Yeah, all sorts of kind of everyday items. Uh, those juicing, ju like juice? mixers, juice making machines, all that stuff. Uh, also, sometimes it was like a, a washing machine or a refrigerator, 
but those were really, really, really expensive, so it was usually given by some three, four friends of yours pinching in together and then giving it to you. And the best part about the gift giving is that all the gifts are given anonymously. They're all put in one big sort of gift pile, but none of them have it saying like, oh, this is from Aunt Nyanya or whatever. No, they're all anonymous, so... Yeah, so that even, even if you can't afford a big gift, no one cares. Because yeah. people were... <laughs> we were poor, but, but we loved each other back then. It's kind of like right now. Yeah. All the gifts were completely anonymous. There was just a pile of them. And then the newlyweds kind of just kind of went there and, and t took a look at them. And I guess, I guess this is, this is about it. Or, or did I forget something? That's been a lot of information about many different things. And you can probably see the differences from how you do it in America and how we do it here. We're just trying our best here, really. And uh, thank you for listening. Please, if you can, and th for this single episode, as this is basically our wedding fundraiser and we have made this list of things that we need. Yeah, <laughs> a buck a show, that's all we ask. In this one case. And if you're, if you're supporting us on Patreon, please, please, we, we don't want extra from you guys. You guys are the best and you're, you're the ones that pay me salary at this point, really. That's my only job here. But for everyone else, if you can afford it, if, if you can do it, if you can't afford it, because I've been in a situation where I can't afford a single euro for something, so don't mind if you can't afford it. If you can afford it, please go to our website, click the donate button and give us one unit of your local currency, whatever that is. We will be very happy and we will post pictures of our wedding and we shall gladly provide some account for how we use all of this. And hey, if you're in Riga in the 15th of September, give us a shout out, you know, send us a message, we could hang out. We can hang out, yeah. I suppose you can come to the church too. Mm -hmm. I suppose so, because why not? We are hospitable people, and we're just common folks who are trying to be trying to be friends and trying to get married finally. In before twenty Americans arrive. <laughs> that would actually be really cool. That would be crazy. If you guys can make it, yeah, feel free to arrive. <laughs> anyway, yeah, and I suppose that's about it. Expect the next episode and a bunch of specials this month, actually, because I intend on walking around and maybe taking some small, tiny videos of Soviet-era monuments here, because there are some things which I want to show you, which I can't really talk about in audio form. Maybe that'll happen. We'll try our best to actually earn our our wedding. So, до свидания, товарищи, and until next time. This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org for more shows like this one. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, theeasternborder.lv, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The eastern border salutes you. The darkness awaits.